Meeting to order, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Jill. Frank Carini. Here. Cheryl Sterniglia. She is on vacation. Amy Malat. Here. Leah Schreiber Johnson. Here. Darren Gabowski. Here. Jane Eikhoff. Here. Mark Verhalen. Vacation. Huh. Kind of jealous. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you. It's a great crowd. So appreciate you uh, attending the meeting today. Uh, for, uh, for the board, number four on the agenda, consent agenda. Any questions or any information regarding A through D? Nothing? Okay. So that motion moves forward. Five, state championship recognition. I will turn it to Scott Holler. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, I asked our Oak Creek Palms team to attend as not this past Saturday, but the previous Saturday. They did something that hasn't been accomplished in 27 years, and that is win the Division I Palms Wisconsin State Championship team. So, um, they are coached by two Oak Creek alumni as well, Sierra Marino and Mariah Marino in the back. Um, the team placed third in their jazz routine and first in Palms, and this is the highest finish they've had in both of those events um, whenever they've been at the state tournament. So this is an incredibly talented group of students. I can't tell you how hard um, the coaches work them. The girls will attest to that. Um, <laughs> Sierra is an outstanding coach, an outstanding, an outst she does all the choreography. Um, she's actually been coaching with us uh, for the last several years, and this year is her first year as the head coach. Uh, her agent called me today, so we're in a contract <laughs> extensions for several more years. Um, we're working that out behind the scenes without her even knowing. Um, so just an incredible group of young ladies, and ladies on behalf of not only the high school, but all of your teachers that you've had in Oak Creek over the years, um, we want to congratulate you. So with that, if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to in introduce them. So ladies, if you want to stand up over by the screen there. Remember they had to names. do. They had to do this on Friday. At the, we did this at the basketball game as well. So you know all their um, names. I'm gonna so I don't screw up any pronunciations. I have my sheet here. <laughs> all right. So our freshman class: um, Cora Lido, Paige Marciniak, Savannah Ruda, and Trinity Siepert. Our sophomores: Mia Chen, Madison Colgrove, Emma Canto, Haley Maloney, Mallory Mahalski, Kaylee Walzak Zalem, and Elizabeth Weinhold. Our juniors, Emma Dockel, Madison Farquhar, Lauren Hacker, and Riley Luell. And our seniors, Layla Nastis, Ali Harris, Rosalie Manicam. They said it correctly, didn't I? <laughs> Annalise Rutowski and McKenna Surma. And I'd like to also mention that Ali Harris, Rosalie Manicam, and McKenna were also named to the All State. They have an opportunity to do solo. Dances at state. Look at me, a palms expert. <laughs> and all three of them were named to the all state team as well. So thank you, ladies. Congratulations. This is an unbelievable achievement. And we will get that banner ordered for the gym and we'll get that up there. And I told Sierra we're gonna leave space so next year when we win it again we have room. So so ladies, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good Mr. Howard, do we want to take a picture with the board or something? I think so. I think that's a good idea. If we could invite the board down by the flag over there, we'll take a picture or something like that. There we Thank go. You ladies. Who's the seniors here? I'm just curious. How many years have you put into dance? Wow, your whole life.
after. One. Thank you. Yeah. Again, that's, that's the fun part of the meetings. So <laughs> the best time for it. Also, just uh, really, Oak Creek is doing really well. I know the swim team on their conference yesterday, wrestling, and then there's the ladies, uh, ladies, ladies nights. So uh, it's been so far a phenomenal year. So congratulations to all of them for all the hard work. All right, public input. We're going to recess form a portion of the meeting to entertain comments or questions on the agenda items. Anybody wishing to uh, to address the board, there is a gold sheet uh, right on the credenza over there on the wall that uh, you can fill out, and then uh, you can hand it to myself or uh, Dan, and uh, you can address the board. If anybody interested in coming to the board or saying anything, comments? Got really quiet in here now. Going once, twice. All right. Reconvene a uh, former portion of the meeting for board discussion and interaction. So we now we go to number seven, new business resolution authorizing the insurance and sales approximately one point five 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 hundred fifty five excuse me one million five hundred fifty five thousand the general uh, general refunding bonds series twenty twenty a. So as you know that uh, we went out to um, bid a refinance. Um, initial projections were one million five hundred fifty five thousand. Um, the sale concluded this morning at um, $1,440,000, so we did quite a bit better. Yeah. Um, that will save us a net of 65000 or approximately $65,000 um, over five years. Our initial projection was about fifty, dollars um, so it turned out a little bit better. Again, important to note that those are all taxpayer dollars, as this is Fund 39 um, money, so we're simply uh, moving that right back to the taxpayers. Um, actually, I just... I um, want to mention we have Todd Tays from Ellers here as well. Um, if there's any specific questions on the borrowing that or uh, the sale that happened this morning. Um, I know one of the concerns is always who bought it. So uh, Morgan Stanley, conglomerate, very large financial institution, um, took care of buying that this morning. And I believe there were six bidders on it. Um, so just in general, like anything, the more bidders you have, the sharper the pencil tends to get. Um, in the grand scheme of things. We have a motion. I recommend that we approve the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of $1,440,000 general obligation refunding bonds series 2020A. Half seconds. Any discussion? Um, I have one. Are we going to make sure that the public knows that? If we can address that. Utilizing saving that and a if it's going down towards debt, I mean that's a positive attribute that we can share to our Oak Creek and Franklin residents. So minimally, I can make a, a particular effort in the board update that goes out tomorrow to highlight the savings that goes to all the households and everyone on our list serve. So I'll make a note. Any other questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 This has to be a roll call vote. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Aye. Amy. Aye. Darren. Aye. Jane? Aye. And I'm an aye. A board nominations to the Wisconsin Council on Special, Special Education. So, Ms. Shriver Johnson mentioned that she wanted to add an item to discuss this evening, so we wrote a quick situation report. And um, Leah, if you'd like to share. Sure. Um, so, I do sit on the... Um, Special Education Parents Advisory Council, and through that um, through that position, I've had the opportunity to get to know uh, one of our parents of a special education student. Um, the parent's name is Janelle Travella, and she approached me about her interest in participating in the state-level version of our district-wide conference, which is a council of parents, special educators. Um, and uh, school uh, DPI representatives. Essentially, this is a DPI council, to be clear. Um, so um, she was interested in participating in that and asked for my support um, in order to provide her with a formal nomination. I said, you know what, I think I can do one better, and let's get the whole board um, to submit, because the, the paperwork, the nomination paperwork, specifically kind of gives you the option of being 
self-nominating or organizational nominating. And I thought, hey, we are the organization that would be um, great to nominate this um, very engaged parent that wants to expand her her um, time and effort um, to give back to kids across the state instead of just in our district. Um, I thought I'd bring that to you and ask for your support. I've already written up the nomination. Um, I shared it with Frank. I'm not sure if it got shared out, but I can certainly read it if you would like me to. Um, I did let um, Janelle know that we were doing, we were going to be talking about this today, but her husband is actually having surgery today, so she was not able to make it, but she said thanks. <laughs> So, so would you like to first. make the formal motion then? Because um, you're the one who brought it to us. Do you yeah, want to take that step? Sure, okay. of course. Yep. Yeah. Took it right out of my mouth. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I just didn't know if we needed to. Oh, I need to do the motion first, Thanks. don't I? Right. Um, so um, I move to nominate J Janelle Travala as the Oak Creek Franklin Joint School District representative to the Wisconsin Council on Special Education. Second. Any discussion? Uh, just a question. Is this a one-year commitment? Do we know, or is it an ongoing? Um, I believe it's more than a year, but I... Yeah. Um, I we thought can, it was three. I, that's what I was thinking, okay. but I, yeah. I didn't okay. want to quote it and be wrong. I no. was thinking it was a three-year three commitment. Three-year commitment, yep. yeah. No, I think it's great that we'll have some representation. And yeah, I, Janelle. Well, we, we're we're simply line. nominating her, and in fact, yes, the, 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 nomin you know, the nominations are sort of on a rolling schedule right, right. now because oh. the actual deadline to kick off this special education council was back in the fall. Mm -hmm. So she's just expressing interest, and um, so I'm not sure exactly what the timeline would be for her actually being accepted onto that council, but we would essentially be assisting her in getting her name on the hat, in the hat. And then she'll give us updates? Would absolutely, good? yeah. Absolutely. Good to... I would, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. in touch with her pretty regularly through good. the parents' advisory, yeah. so I'm yeah. sure that I would hear. Yep. You said you wrote a nomination for her. Can I did, I wrote it? a little. Can you read it? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <clears throat> And I wrote this when I was um, I was really thinking of it being myself nominating. Um, so I'll change the wording a little bit to make it a group representation. Um, so I, I wrote, um, Janelle Travala is an engaged parent of a student with special needs in the Oak Creek Franklin School District. I've had the pleasure of working alongside her on the district special needs parent advisory for the last year and a half. And I'm happy to make this nomination. Janelle is an important member of our community. Uh, very giving of her time and voice for kids and families all over the region through her thoughtful involvement and volunteerism in the name of improving experiences for others. The OCFSD, Special Needs Parent Advisory, has a lot of similarities to the Wisconsin Council. It's a diverse group of parents, special education professionals, and district leaders meeting regularly with the intent of improving experiences for families and making the most of the resources available to ensure we are doing the best we can for every child. Janelle's contribution to this group is significant, and she has more to give. I have no doubt that she would be a strong asset to the statewide committee, bringing a practical understanding of the everyday challenges and successes experienced by families navigating and advocating for special education. She is a great communicator, always clear and caring, empathetic, and committed to continuous improvement. The Wisconsin Council on Special Education would be lucky to have Janelle's point of view at hand, as well as her all-in mentality on making Wisconsin a better place for all of our public education students and families. Feel free to contact me anytime to further discuss my nomination. Awesome. There was a second, Darren, you seconded? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Thanks, Leah. Excellent. I'll adjust the wording to make it a group <laughs> statement and submit that on our behalf. Thank uh, you. Thank you. 2020-21 school year calendar update. So we have um, Mrs. Bennett and Dr. K here if you have any questions about this, but we went through it the last time. This was the update to reflect the regional spring break last time. Do you have a motion? Bikoff moves to accept the 2020-21 20, 20, um, school year calendar. I'm a lot second. Any discussion? I know I talked to other, two other, actually yesterday, uh, two different different school districts. This is like the hottest thing right now because they're all making adjustments. Um, the only place I know is in the Grafton North Shore area. They are keeping it, which 
It's interesting, the last week in April. So it's oh. extremely late. Um, but everybody else is going, is amending to what we're doing. So uh, I know me personally feel very comfortable with this, this one year, and then there's another one coming in a couple years down the road. But so I have a feeling we have a lot of um, folks who have um, uh, spouses or kids Correct. in neighboring districts. It'll yep. align a lot of people's vacation schedules, probably make a lot of people happy. At the end of the day, so. I did receive one email saying, why are we doing this again? But I explained it, and she's like, I got it. Is when everyone's going on spring break at the same time. Expensive. It's expensive. <laughs> yeah, all right. And um, same one my one. kid said she likes going on spring break and coming back and then not having much time left for school. <laughs> yeah, all right. right. So, mm -hmm. here with Callie next. It does go quick. <laughs> it does go quick when it's like that. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 We'll say nay. Uh, the second reading. Sorry, read Callie. <laughs> oh, and you have something to say? Oh, and I have something. Oh yeah, I do just want to say um, from bringing up the having, students having off Martin Luther King Jr. Day and teachers having a half day, the response was very positive from all the people I shared that with at the high school. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, second reading of the revised policy 8A2 in relation to the booster parent organizations. So we brought this forward on January 27th. Um, I'll put the redlined version up again. Um, but again, this was just adding some language around um, one, <clears throat> making sure that the booster clubs and or parent organizations are submitting some sort of financial record on a monthly basis to the school liaison, um, whether that's Scott at the high school, principals at the elementary school. Um, so they'd be doing that on a monthly basis. And then adding um, just a little bit uh, more oversight and protection on both sides, both the district and the organization, um, that they would receive um, a month of random to supply a bank statement, a bank reconciliation and the financial statements supplied to um, the building liaison. Um, again, looking for kind of that triangle of review of the numbers to make sure that um, to the best that we can that everything is going well with both the organization from the organizational side and that um, school liaison is in agreement with that particular, um, the, the way the booster club and our PTA is going. I have a motion. We need a motion. Um, I recommend approving the change to the policy 882 as presented. Second. Discussion, Darren? I just seen on the news about MPS, about their booster clubs, fundraising popcorn and yep. stuff, and the kids not getting the money. The adults are keeping it. So, yeah. Just, uh, the yeah, MPS, like, you said? Yeah. <coughs> I was on the news last night, actually. So we don't have specific guidelines, but that would be something Karen and I would work on in the business office is where do we check? So first thing we would do is try to back into the number and see if there's just a miscalculation somewhere along the way. Be the first step. If we were to um, <clears throat> think that anything criminal is happening or something is way out of line, we would get the Oak Creek police involved immediately, turn it over to their forensic team and let them handle it at that point. We're not forensic accountants by any means. Um, but if we see something as funny, we'll certainly pass it on. And then you're going to notify all the booster clubs and the organizations, let them know, hey, the board decided to do it this way because we want to make sure your checks and balances are there. So we'll talk with the principals. Uh, I think our meetings are next week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, so we'll talk with them at that time. Um, and I'll have a specific uh, conversation with Scott outside of this simply because he handles more groups. Um, typically, the PTAs, the principal, will be able to handle that very easily some rationale we provide them at the principal's meeting and then um, I'll work with uh, Sue and Megan at the middle school level if they need a little bit more assistance and then again I'll have a meeting with Scott and um, we've actually talked about this change already um, just kind of leading up to developing the process um, and so he's aware of kind of the thought process but I'll make sure he has all the questions he needs answered. That was my question I just want to make sure Scott has enough support on that. He's got a lot on his plate right now. It'd bring out a lot of extra work. Yeah, <laughs> truthfully, if everything matches out, it really shouldn't be that much. Like it should be. Yep. Check it pretty quickly. It's when okay. there's a discrepancy is when it adds time in, to it. In all likelihood, that will be the that will be the mo going forward, right? It yep. should be something that is a characteristic of the system. It should be hygienic. It should just 
move forward in a thoughtful kind of way like that. But if there's something that's amiss, it'll give us an opportunity to correct the error or figure out what's up. No, because it's easy to talk about it because I've been with Mr. Cubs for many years. Yep. And the treasurer position, they're not an accountant or a CPA or anything, so it's really difficult for them. That first year is a hard year of learning. The second year, you know, they're starting to get used to it. And if they luckily they stayed there three or four years, then they got it. I was just talking to another booster club uh, treasurer yesterday, uh, two days ago, and it's getting all the numbers to work. And people are saying, "Well, where'd all this money go?" It takes time to put all this money, uh, money, all this information to the computer. People think it's an easy job, but it's hours, monthly hours for that volunteer. <laughs> I, I know how that goes. A little experience there, on here. Yes, yes, I know how that goes. I don't know if I here since we're being streamed or whatever, but I, I can tell you, Andy's right that all these groups already have monthly meetings. So now it's just one. It's really just submitting something monthly. Yeah. I'm very confident with all of our groups. Um, like Darren said, they work really hard um, and they do a great job. But they're already having these monthly meetings. They're already talking about their financials at their monthly meeting. So I, I think it'll be pretty seamless. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Informational items, academic career planning annual update. Welcome, Mr. Krennic and company. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is an annual update for academic and career planning. Um, instead of reading through the whole uh, situation report, we put together a presentation to kind of go through it step by step. Um, the most important piece to academic and career planning is getting students ready for college and career readiness. So with us, we have Ms. Farnsworth, a school counselor, and Ms. McHenry, AP. Here you go, John. Okay, like um, John said, this is the yearly update of what has changed with academic and career planning, which is something that We'll get into it the state. We do have a compliance part here that we are doing this with our seniors and that they have a full academic and career plan by the time they graduate. So um, we're gonna give you some updates. So ACP is a student driven and supported by the teachers um, to create an informed based um, post-secondary pro, ex, um, I should say, successful type of career plan that they would have in place, not just I'm going here or something like that. They're thinking this through. So this year, we're starting to move beyond the classroom and trying to connect to businesses. Um, we'll talk about the Career Expo. We had our third one. And career planning now has changed platforms. It's now called Zello. Before it was career cruising. And all schools, 6 through 12, work on the academic plan. So ACP is aligned to district goals. We snugly fit into the fifth one, career and college readiness. And we have figured out as a committee how to actually uniquely pair college and career ready and social emotional learning. And Jen Farnsworth will get into that in a bit. So the district has had this for a while. We've had the framework. Um, through the paths for graduation. Zello is the ACP tool that we use to collect this for the state. And the IT, we have support in it. It's in part of Infinite Campus, and that's how we report out to DPI that how many kids have this report at the end of their 12th grade year. And again, it aligns with school improvement goal number five. It fulfills requirements. Um, the change for this year is that we are moving more into the cred credentials. Um, our goal is to align with stuff beyond night advisory. For the past three, four years, this has been more of a compliance, a check off. We did the lesson, the kid got a grade, we created a report at the end of the year and we gave it to DPI. What we are trying to move to is a culture of ACP. So moving outside of that classroom and that checkoff list into actually having this something that is living with kids and teachers. So we are moving into more things with um, the career credentials. We, um, for example, we're connecting to the community. Some of the kids in some of the business classes, they're creating websites for real clients. It's not just um, something that is more of an exercise in class. Um, 
We have more job shadows and apprenticeships going on. And the autos class is actually having clients. They will work on your car. So things like that are starting to move this entire um, process forward. This year we had our third annual Career Expo, and again it was a success. We had more students and parents this year. I have no idea why it went down last year, but um, this year we had a lot more kids, a lot more, um, the vendors were the same, but a lot more conversations, and I have a video clip that Knight's um, production put together for me. Um, lessons that prepared the kids, they had informational career interviews talking about how do you talk to somebody how do you, you know, get to talk to somebody, a business rep, so that it's meaningful and it's not, you're not nervous. So we did have questions for the kids. Um, we did provide information about who's attending, which sparked conversations in classrooms. And some teachers actually created their own lessons because they wanted the kids in their classroom to do something special at the um, Career Expo. A lot of the math teachers did that. They want to connect math to this. I'm hoping this works because last year this did not. Um, I asked for a minute long video. It's a minute three seconds. <laughs> oh. Get some sound on it. Um, I don't know. There's just music. So if it doesn't work, it's just background music. No music. Well, at least we got pictures. It's still a big it's improvement. It's moving. It's a big Very improvement. So it's great. We only had two no-shows this year. And so last year we had a lot of no-shows, so that was good. So They're lost. What? They're lost. They're lost, yeah. yeah. The, the first year we had snow on this day, but we had a huge turnout. So that was great. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen Farnsworth. Um, as you may have known over the last couple of years, we've been using Career Cruising. That was kind of our platform tool. And then at the end of last year, we were told that Career Cruising would be no more. And I did cry a little <laughs> um, based on the amount of work we had put into lessons and times building Career Cruising. So the one thing about Zello, it's a more of a web-based um, than Career Cruising was. For example, you learned really quickly that this age does not know how to use the save button. They haven't been trained like I did in my don't save it, you know, it went away. They just are used to, they type it in, they leave. Saves still automatically. There. Yeah. Saves automatically. <laughs> right. So there are some things that are definitely an advantage with the Zello platform. But I think even more so the change really forced us to rethink about what ACP and what the tool means versus what ACP looks like in our district. Um, we have a, a lot of fantastic ACP type activities going throughout the departments. You know, making the auto shop and the welding shop look like a shop, um, creating the restaurants, the businesses, working with real Oak Creek businesses. All those things are phenomenal, and we do a really good job. And I must say, from going through a lot of the CT workshops, we're way ahead of a lot of districts in that area. Our biggest thing is pulling everything together, and um, Zello is one of the ways we're trying to do that. One of the biggest changes I think we made this year, at least, um, at the high school level is really working with educating our educators, um, even more so than educating the students. Um, that mentoring piece, that one-on-one -on -one piece, that's really important, um, those interviewing skills, um, helping students connect with the outside world. We really are relying on our Knights Advisory teachers, and, and for a lot of them, that's a brand new arena that they've never used before. 
they're very um, solid on their subjects. Um, but when we start talking about um, influences that affect students and how they make decisions after high school, that's sometimes a little bit more of a gray area. So we are using the academic and career planning tool Zello to start create some of those lessons. I'm not saying we're not using the Zello, but we've almost um, tailorized it more to OC, OCHS instead of Zello itself. And so if the tool changes, um, the process and what we're learning won't be as affected. And I think that was a really good change. Um, not expected, sometimes force is the best way to learn new things. Um, we are still obviously using the student outcomes that were set up by DPI in terms of what our students need to know. One of the big changes at the middle school this year was they um, changed doing their ACP conferences individually. They moved to a group presentation and under the My Academic and Career Plan is one of the activities they had every eighth grader lay out basically where they wanted to go, what they were looking for in their future, and then that was shared with their families. So can you just back to that so mm -hmm. does that mean so the middle schoolers don't have the individual ACP conferences anymore they met as groups this year that oh. was something the middle school decided on yet the high school still did um, meet with um, the 11th graders individually one of the things with the eighth graders you kind of all know where they're going next year they're going to high school um, 11th graders not so much um, there's a, a lot more options and I think um, it will be harder to do that as a group as they did in the eighth grade um, some of the other big changes that um, Stacy alluded to was when um, the Zello change came, first came out, immediately my thought was, oh dear, I have to start over again and I need more help. Um, and actually that worked out to be a really awesome blessing. Um, I was part of the BLT program this summer and I started working with other committees and our goals are basically the same, but we need to push the rock together instead of your rock over here and my rock over there. And so one of the things that we really did with the high school activities this year was to start planning as a group. And Stacy mentioned how we start bringing in some of the DESA or the CASEL, which is the social emotional learning. And so social emotional learning, some of the things like self-awareness, relationship skill building, um, these are decision making are very in tune to ACP. How can they not be when you're the, the, the same things? Soft skills and relationships um, building, decision making is all over ACP. So how can we incorporate those together and not give our staff one more thing to do, but a way to do it more seamlessly? So that's, I think we're just at the beginning of this journey and I'm really excited about those pieces of it. One of the things that, um, oops, sorry. One of the things that you, I could show this in is in the academic planning, and this was a slide actually that we showed last year, and it's something that we've been working on for years, was really developing those pathways. Now, what I wanna do is kind of talk about how these now changed into what we're doing new with ACP. So with the um, all school planning, <clears throat> we started um, exactly that, all school planning this year, meaning that we wanted every faculty be involved with students choosing their classes. Obviously, at the high school level, choosing your classes is a huge piece of ACP. Um, teachers are doing wonderful things. We need to get the right kids in the right classes so they're experiencing all these wonderful things that the district is doing. Um, however, um, I can no longer meet with every single student and do programming like we did 10 years ago. That's just not the case. We need everyone involved. That means that every teacher needs to know about what's going on throughout the building, not just in their own departments. And that's kind of an entire switch again with that culture that we're talking about instead of ACP being a lesson that we're doing in advisory. And so we did a thing called All School Planning Week and we encouraged all the teachers to get involved with talking to their students about what they did in their careers. Um, we even, for example, we did a college day um, where teachers were asked to where, you know, where they went to school and then talk about it. Why did they choose that school? How did they choose their major? Kind of the process and make it more real and tangible for students. PBIS, that committee that day, sent out flyers for teachers to hang on their wall. What school did I go to? What did I major in? Ask me about kind of thing. And so that was just a small example of different committees getting together to sh do one purpose. So that's just a small piece of some of the stuff that's going on. So um, what's next? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I really think we need to take a look at is the conferencing and mentoring piece of that. That's one-on-one -on -one relationship building. And so we're working with um, CISA One. I have been very excited to be invited to a numerous um, workshops this year on ACP. Um, and I'm 
very grateful for those opportunities. In fact, that's where I was today. And um, it's really changing my view on how ACP should work and what it should look like in a district, especially of our size. And one of the things that came out of that was working with a gentleman at CESA that helps train educators on conferencing, basically meaning how do we help kids bring them, bring them to the table and really talk about their future goals and plans and what barriers and opportunities they have. One of the biggest things with CASEL that we talk about, our students that aren't doing well do not have an optimistic thinking. And how do we change that? Because no matter how good we're doing with ACP, if our kids do not feel like they have a future, we're fighting for it, um, we have a problem. And so those are the things that we're really looking at changing. And um, in terms of our aspect um, with the ACP lessons. Um, in terms of what's going on in CTE and um, the departments, that stuff's just taking off like crazy, it's awesome. Our departments are fantastic. Where are you gonna talk about this? My three minutes are up, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I talk so long. <laughs> Any questions? I have more of a comment, I guess, versus a, a question. As a parent of a high school student, I can't stress enough how much we need to do, or I'd love to even see more of at an earlier age, giving them information, experiences to help them determine where they want to go. When I went to college, everyone said, you know, um, you don't have to decide till you, the end of your sophomore year in college what you want to be, because <clears throat> it's all general classes. Now you want your child to go to a school that has a strong program in what they want to do. Um, I try to give my daughter information on different things, but I feel a lot of times like people told her early on, you should go into engineering because you're good at science and math. And for the longest time, it's like, okay, because people told me that. She didn't really know what engineering was. Um, when we were at a conference recently for a school board, um, you know, there was a, a presentation I went to about they spent the entire freshman year taking them to colleges, bringing people in, talking about how much you made, talking about what this education was. I think often if students don't have someone in their family member that they, in their family, that they see what that person does every day, um, it's hard for them to know what's all out there and available. Um, and they, we have such a great number of programs in our district of if you want to do this, you can take classes in, in high school to kind of even get a head start on things. You hate for them to get to their junior year and they've taken some and it's not really what they want. So the earlier we can do things to help give them all that information about what's available, just the better. Can I take a comment? Yeah, please. I don't want to argue with you, disagree with you, but I am going to a little bit. I have a daughter who's a senior in high school right now. Um, and one of the things that also that I've been working with, I went to a CTE conference. In 10 years, they say 65% of the jobs that exist today will not exist. Sure. So we're, it's very difficult to train students and get them geared in one arena when they're, when basically what the world around us is saying is that that may, that's no longer how it's going to work. Um, that learning acuity is actually the number one thing that we can teach our students that they know how to learn well and that they are flexible enough to do it. And so I think we're almost entering a new era. I told one of my high school students in class the other day, office the other day, you're the first generation I've had in my office that I don't know what your children will be doing, or even kind of envision what they'll be doing. We kind of hung out at the malls, we went to movies, like, we drove cars, like, I'm, I'm not even sure about that for their kids. And so, to train them, I think, I think we're entering a whole new era. As one, as one of the speakers said, that we are in um, an industrial revolution on fast forward. We've done industrial revolutions before, but never at this speed. Um, and quite frankly, we're not always that quick as an education system to change. And so I, I think there's some struggle in that. Um, and we do need to think about how we manage these. I think it's going to be different than how we've always done it. Interesting also, um, so research says, I filled that on there, but it's interesting <clears throat> that you know, Generation Y or X, right? Uh, but it's interesting because, like, you look at in the past generations, you stay at your job for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. That was a norm. They're, the average saying that the, the average job term is going to be about two years because they just want to get better. They want to make a lot of money quicker, right? But there's not the patient level or the longevity or the, the loyalty anymore as it used to be. And it's, 
that's a big, big change for employers. How's that mindset? And so it's going to be interesting, kind of like I agree with Jane, to see both sides of it. Because yeah. there's going to be jobs that we never thought of today and will probably be around 10, 15 years from now. Even if you're not training right. them to do the job in high school, just the education right. to, here's all the options. Before I spend you know, 300000 sending her to Marquette to be an engineer, and then she's like, ah, oh, I don't like this. You know, like, I, I would love them to really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you're right. But what are, what are all of the, you know, things that she can think about that my husband and I don't always know about to provide? College programs are changing, too, obviously. Um, also too like slowly. I was going to say also too. You know, we meant you mentioned that it can be, it can be difficult to, to turn a big ship, right? And I mean, universities are experiencing that too. It's not like they're all turning on a dime. Um, and I would just point out too that um, I was, I you know, one of my roles at UWM for many years was counseling freshmen about what they were going to do, and um, most of them don't know, and that's just the reality. And, and, you know, Callie isn't behind um, for not being sure that she wants to be an engineer while she's still in high school, you know. And, um, and I think that, um, and I just, I just Googled it really quick, and the first thing that came up was 80% of students in the U.S. end up changing their major at least once. 80%. Um, so there you go. It's an, an uncertain world, and the best we can do is, is give them lots of great experiences. While we have them. So if you can teach them how to take them on their own and what their skills are, how those attitudes work, those are things that we can do and we need to get better on. What's my learning style? What am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I need to change? And just show them where it's at as long, even as adults, we can teach them. And it's exciting too with the CTE expansion, or, you know, the, the, um, the, the building talk. being built and everything that's happening there in the next couple of years it's going to be exciting to see too where all this goes and you guys can yeah. talk in the microphone. We so can't pick whenever up, so. you're that far from yeah. the microphone, no one, at home, there's thousands of people watching thousands, at home yes. right now, <laughs> and they can't hear yeah. any of So, yeah. any so of when, you, when you talk, if you can cluster, so we can pick it up on the stream part. So I'm going to sum up, right? So let me try. Okay, <laughs> so we're extremely concerned with dispositions at this point that we've reached in education, right? Um, it used to be knowledge and skills that we spent an eternity like working on planning mm -hmm. for right but dispositions like in the world right now become critically important because we don't know where the next augmented reality designer is sitting right now and how to prepare them for that path but we know that skills right knowledge exposure um, and dispositions more than ever are critical facets of folks entering the workforce tomorrow next year 10 years after that Right. And this is one of those programs that the deeper we delve into it and the more hands that we have actively participating in that work in our buildings, the better off our kids going to be as they go forward. Fair? Yeah. I was listening real close. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. well, Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, first reading of the pro uh, procedure policy 8301, use of school facilities in our ball diamond complex. We have another special guest tonight, <laughs> Ms. Ryan's, here to join us to walk us through some changes Hello, here. That was a really good cerebral conversation, and now I feel like we're going back to the facilities. <laughs> oh, no, we'll go deep with this, too. It's all right. So we have, we're we going to have some new facilities to be able to share with the community, right? Hey. So you'll probably be seeing me frequently when we're ready to roll out the next ones, right? But for right now, we're looking at the new baseball and softball complex. Uh, we have a lot of people that are very interested in renting, and uh, we needed to come up with some guidelines for their use. So we, we Scott and I, Scott Holler and I, worked at looking at what other area complexes provide, what their rates are, what some of their guidelines are for their use. And quite honestly, the only one out there that's really close to what we have is Kenosha Unified Indian Trails. Um, it's a public school, it's a turf field. So 
a lot of what we've come up with is based on what they do. There are others in the area like Greendale has Brinkman Field or Madison has some ball diamonds that they make available, but all of those are grass fields. Um, Greenfield, Conkle Park rents out their facilities, again, grass field. So Kenosha is really kind of the template for us to use for what we looked at. Um, underneath the regulations, I just I put in red those things that are being revised or added based on the ball diamond needs. So regulations, buildings and facilities should be available for community rental as follows. Those are listed there. We've added um, the Sunday use has been in our policy for a while, but we're adding in Saturday and Sunday use of the outdoor facilities and put in uh, parameters there. Um, really made a big deal about no metal cleats, no shelled nuts, no seeds, no sunset flower seeds, no chewing gum allowed anywhere on the complex. So some of those things are very um, clear. And Heather, can I just add one thing? Would yes. those be consistent with the high school turf football field as well? Yes. Those yes. same items? Yes. Yep. And, and actually the turf the company that's putting in the fields has signage to that effect on the outside of the building or outside of the complex and the fencing, but we'll make sure that it's clear when people are signing up to reserve the facilities too. And real quick, um, for baseball, softball, I know coaches um, with little guys or girls, they like to throw the ball up and have them hit it against the fence. And I've found out over the years it bows out the fence, and I don't want to ruin the new ball fields like that. Okay. That, that worries me. Yeah, they can go in the cage. Yeah, I just yeah. worry. They still do it. Yeah. It worries me. Yeah. We we'll don't talk about that. Yep. Right. We'll get that signage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we did put in some timelines for reservation dates as you go further down on reservation times. Groups two through three, so that's basically anybody in the community other than the school district proper, um, have rights to reserve beginning in January, but they won't be able to reserve until at the facility until after this, the season is done for the high school. So we're saying tentatively June 15th. We don't want people to be reserved in there on June 10th, and then we still have ball games that are going on. So have a conflict to that. So we're waiting it out until June 15th to start for both the girls and the boys. Now, if they become available a little bit earlier than that, um, then they'll be available on a first come first serve basis. Yeah, and just to intervene, Heather and I had a long discussion about that because I'm sure as boarders, you'll hear from community members that want to start renting it in April. And we understand that, but I think as, as part of the referendum and, and folks know, obviously our, our first priority is to the WIA season that our high school teams have to have to follow. And with the Springs in Wisconsin being what they are, we would not want to tell a, a local team or an organization from, you know, let's say uh, Waukesha or whoever would rent it that, oh, hey, we need to make up a double header with Kenosha Tremper or whoever it is, so we need to bump you. We So to play it safe, basically, what we're doing is waiting until the WIA seasons are done, but they will have that Sunday option, which will be nice. So then the other is to what we just added in the lighted fields of the turf stadium will now have lighted fields. And then if you go down um, even further, if you had any questions, um, the pricing um, is listed in there too for fields. It has the reservation times and then the ball diamond pricing is on there. So the turf stadium, the row one is our use, two is the city use, three is an Oak Creek nonprofit group that would be $25 an hour and then the external nonprofit is 60 and the for-profit groups would be 85 excuse me Heather mm -hmm. Scott so like the zone and the storm teams is that the $25 an yep. hour okay yep. and that's okay. A, a very reasonable rate I mean no, if you want to compare it if you want to compare it to the rock for example um, my yep. son you know ate you last year playing up at the rock that was yep. I believe 150 an hour so, for a little diamond. So if I'm correct on this, it would be if they do it at nine o'clock at night for some reason, um, it would be twenty five plus an additional eleven for lights. Got it. Will they have access to the facilities, use the restrooms and stuff? Yeah, they have. We we have to be able to have the restrooms available to them. We're just trying to figure out how to do that. So it probably would be like an access. It's going to be the access reader on that door. Yeah, that makes sense. And then be able to have yeah. the person who rents it have the access reader to. Again, I'll just reiterate, this was our way of, again, wanting to 
you. say thank you to the to the folks in, in our community in that first tier right. that a allowed us to get these facilities. So while we're not going to make everyone happy, we all know that, this is a very generous rate. Oh, yeah, let use a... A single game in Kenosha is $80. A doubleheader is 135 And then a two-hour practice is 50 We didn't break out between practices and games. We didn't really care. We do care, but we didn't. it doesn't make a difference. It's $25 an hour, so it's cleaner to watch. Have the same tier pricing for, like, the gyms for yep. like basketball yes. as well? Yes. Okay. I've had a number of questions from parents who are in sports where considered a feeder like let's say girls basketball, Lucknick helps train all the coaches in that program. It's based on the number of people on the team that are from the city, 75% or more. So we don't have feeder teams, but if it's 75% or more, then they're in Oak Creek, tier, tier three, essentially. So just to reiterate, the purpose of this is to help the veterans keep up with their education. That cost, electricity. <laughs> so then we did add the Saturday and Sunday, but we don't want to be going back and forth with different teams in and out. So if you're going to use it on a Saturday and Sunday, you're going to get it for the whole day. And a whole day rental is $500. And that, again, is comparable to what you would have over at um, Kenosha Indian Trails. Exactly their rates. They'd be allowed to have tournaments there then? But at five hundred dollars, I'm just because that's a lot of teams coming. Yes, yeah, so we've already been contacted. Um, there's a kind of the top showcase organization is in Wisconsin for baseball is Prep Baseball Report. They've already their directors already reached out to Heather and I about trying to schedule a two day showcase event there. Awesome. So yeah, it's a, obviously we're a great location in terms of so I'm Milwaukee on County and Kenosha <laughs> County and so on and so forth. I agree. So on the protective side, there's damage. Do we? Are there certain insurance policy on this? No. This would be the same policy as we have for all of our other facilities. It's a million dollar for a single event, or if you have a group of over 300 attending, then it's a $3 million insurance policy on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. So are all of these um, staff, equipment, and supplies fees applied to everyone, or just like tiers, groups two through five? Right, it would be tiered groups, two through five. Right, you wouldn't have to pay if you were gonna if it was a high school organization that was using the facility. No, it wouldn't be a rental charge or anything. Right. Any other questions? Very good. So then we'll see you again in a couple of weeks, and we'll talk about this some more. Right. Thank yes, you for all your you hard work much. on this. Yeah. Thank you. It's April's exciting. Soon. All right. Update on the four K sites. Hi. So um, I kind of gave you a summary in the situation report about 4K. It's uh, been in the district since 2006. We started um, in area child care centers. Um, Salvation Army, Tony's here from Salvation Army, um, was our partner from the very beginning. And so as space became available in our schools, we would move classrooms into the schools and had uh, fewer and fewer uh, leases with the child care. Then we had uh, spaces at St. John's for a little bit, at Harvest Community for a little bit, always with Salvation Army. For the 2021 school year, we have found space um, in uh, Cedar Hills. And so we have determined to exit Salvation Army and um, open spaces in Cedar Hills and then if needed at Meadowview. Um, what I put together is kind of a child care availability. That's always been a question during registration, which is the week of March 16th this year. Um, what's available for child care? So um, the, the report kind of talks about different child care centers that are available. And Salvation Army, we've met and we will do the transportation to and from for the wraparound for children whose parents would like that for the opposite section. So if you attend the morning um, but want to go to Salvation Army for the afternoon, they um, we have this agreement and partnership that we'll work through. So 
Cedar Hills will be a new site. Um, I met with um, Kids in Care and Falk, Falk Park. Um, they're both area child care centers, and they're both excited to partner um, when we transport students from Cedar Hills. Wow, I see this. I'm just curious. I read this wrong. Only Shepherd Hill, Shepherd Hills kids are going to be picked up by the Southeast. Or is that any of the elementaries? Nope. So I'm working with um, Tony and Major Bob at Salvation Army, just depending on when the parents come to enroll. Uh, Rightway has agreed to uh, transport from some of our other schools. Um, for, if, uh, for Salvation Army. For Salvation oh. Army, yep. Um, so we just we need to know the need first. Yep, I understand. Um, right now it just looks like Shepherd Hill. Yep. Good but question. On the bottom it says... Um, other areas. Two questions, Lisa. How many students are in our program? We hover around 300. 300? Mm -hmm. Okay. Staffs, um, student size classrooms? Do you About think 20. Eight? I was going to say 18 mm -hmm. to 20. Okay. Yep. TJ, I just want to say thank you for all the years that you teamed up with us. So please tell Salvation Army thank you. Yeah. And I was around in 2006 when that came around and uh, couldn't say thank you for. Uh, the partnership, the collaboration for our kids, um, and the facility that you provided and the guidance. I just want to say thank you, and please tell everybody else at Salvation Army. Um, we really do appreciate it. Anybody okay. else got any questions? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Review upcoming bo uh, school board meeting attendant agendas. So you'll hear from Ms. Ryan again uh, late in the month. And we'll also hear from Forest Ridge. We'll talk HRAs. Uh, we'll bring back the board meeting schedule for 2021. We've been working on that. And we'll have a financial update. Early March, uh, we'll come back around the board schedule for the year. We'll talk about self-funding of our health insurance. And our students might have something to share with us as well. Um, if anybody has any other agenda items they'd like uh, explored, you can talk to me or Frank. Um, and there you go. When will the next building update be? Dan had it in his email. Uh, it was in there. Was it? So I think we'll see. So you'll Forest Ridge back with you February 24th. So we'll get a school update from them. Is that what you, is that what you meant? Well, I think no. you're talking Nexus? Yes. I think oh, we're looking at the end of March, right? It's end of March. March. Yep. Is end of March. March. Okay. Yep. I thought it was the 20th. Thanks. Now I get it. I'll make a note. It's spring break. It's the. Uh, Okay. Okay. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. Robert Johnson motions to adjourn the meeting. Second. Any discussion? We lost. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Thank you, everyone, to the town. Have a good night. <laughs>